Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Deke to Deke. In this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Wake Forest Hall of Famer and former NBA All-Star Josh Howard. Josh and I had a chance to talk about some of the adversity he's had to overcome, getting into coaching, and of course, his favorite Deacon moment, plus much, much more. So stay tuned, and as always, go Deeks. So Josh Howard, born and raised yes, in Winston-Salem. Uh, what was it like growing up in Winston-Salem for you? Um, it was a blessing. Um, I think those that know me know that I love my hometown. Um, my family definitely, you know, made sure I got to experience everything Winston had to offer growing up and also, you know, sheltered me from the things that I shouldn't, you know, know and learn about. But I, as I got older, you know, you couldn't help but figure those things out with yourself. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I, I love Winston. That's like I said, that's home, man. And like you know me personally, like I said, uh, I, I love Winston Salem, man. It's, it's just, it's just where I'm from. It's a great city, man. I mean, I I love being back. It's like, uh, you know, my second home. Uh, so I, I didn't realize how many years I had been here already. Uh, but it's it's, yeah. it's wonderful city. So Josh, everybody knows about you being the the great basketball player. Was basketball your first true love, or were there other sports in your life before you got to that? Yeah, believe it or not, there, there were definitely other sports in my life before basketball. And first being football, <laughs> had a short-lived career playing football. I played in uh, 89 and 91 for the Winston-Salem Greyhounds and uh, got humbled real quick because I, I knew I was a great outdoor football player with the neighborhood uh -huh. kids. So when I got into organized football, I got stuck with the number 63 my second year and play, had to play defensive line. And from that point on, I realized I wasn't going to be a football player. <laughs> <laughs> then I tried to transition over to baseball, and I definitely was excelling in that. But um, as I hit puberty, uh, my strike zone really got large to the point where I had to swing at everything. So I left baseball alone because I knew it was going to be hard to, you know, stick with the, the swinging and the running and all that good stuff. So. I uh, ventured into basketball, man, and I definitely wasn't the best basketball player, you know, as far as like going through my teenage years. Um, it was something that definitely grew on me. And um, once I got to high school is when I kind of realized, like like my sophomore year of high school, that I could have an opportunity, you know, and further my career in basketball if I took it serious. So uh, Coach Cloud was like my first mentor, or oh, Coach Brayboy, actually at uh, Parkland High School. Those two coaches definitely influenced me to stick with basketball throughout, you know, high school and you know, look what it did. You know, it, it definitely produced somebody who, you know, loved the game and, and loved the passion of the game. Well, Josh, when did you know that, hey, I could play at the next level? I could play in the ACC? Um, Probably when I went to Hargrave Military Academy after I finished high school. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't pass the SAT, so I had to take another year. So and actually I passed it in three months once I got to Hargrave. But I took a year, you know, just to better myself off the court as far as like passing my SAT. And uh Coach Shepherd up there, um, and Coach Keats, who's now the head coach, I think at NC State was the assistant at the time. They definitely seen something in myself and, you know, was able to help me scratch the surface and, you know, further my career as far as being a D1 player. And uh Coach Odom, I never forget. You know, I tried to get in as like, I think they just called it Prop 48 back in the day, where you yep. go in and, and you had to sit out your first semester with Coach Odom didn't want that. He wanted me, you know, first semester. So he told me if I went up there, passed my SAT, and a lot of people didn't know I played center in high school. So I was a back to the basket guy and I could shoot anything mid range, but I had to learn how to face up and, you know, handle the ball which, you know, at first it was like a shock. Like I didn't have a clue what the hell I was doing. But <laughs> as time progressed, I got comfortable with handling the ball and bringing it up and understanding that I wasn't a natural point guard or a guy to handle the ball, but I knew I could play off the ball with the best of them. So I just really figured out my niche kind of early and, and ran with it. And, you know, Coach Odom kept his word and gave me that one scholarship that Wake Forest had for men's basketball. And for me, that was just like a special moment, even coming back into my hometown and being able to, you know, showcase my talents. Because I actually think I was player of the year in that area two years in a row, my junior and sophomore year of high school. So 
I think a lot of people kind of the typical story, they see a kid that's good in basketball in high school and then goes away and they're ready to write me off. But for me to come back and, you know, prove a lot of people wrong, that was the most gratifying, gratifying moment in my life right there. Well, I'm glad you did come back. Uh, so you're at Hargrave. You got these opportunities coming across, right? You passed the SAT. Mm -hmm. What was it about Wake? Was it just that Wake was hometown? Because, I mean, there were some op other options here in North Carolina within a two-hour drive that were some powerhouses. Yeah. What was it that stood out about Wake? Honestly, outside of me coming back home, it was when, and I'm pretty sure you remember this, when we had to write that essay about being a humanitarian before you even got into Wake Forest. Yep. And I was always a humble guy and loved my community, but, but that really opened my eyes to Wake Forest as far as like them wanting to give back to the Winston-Salem area, understanding that you have to give back or pay it forward to your community in order to see, you know, success or growth. So for me, that was an eye opener at a young age. And I mean, after that, I was just ready to, you know, be a demon deacon. <laughs> so you had an interesting career. I mean, you played for Coach Odom and both Coach Prosser as well. What was mm -hmm. it like playing for those two great coaches, and, and what do they mean to you? First off, both of them mean the world to me. You know, like I said, again, with Coach Odom, giving me that opportunity, him and Mr. Wellman, that one scholarship, they could have gave it to anybody, and they kept their word. So. For me, that that just, you know, as a young black man, your word is all you got. And for somebody <laughs> yeah. to give you that, yep. you know, I, 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 all I could do was, you know, see loyalty in Wake Forest. And then uh, Skip Prosser came along, man, and I, he found the whole nother gear in me that I didn't even know I had, you know, with the way he coached, the way he coached off the court. And uh, one of his fans that I stick with is, it's not what you do from three to six because our practice was always three to six. He used to always mm -hmm. say it was what you did from six to three, you know, and that was the time that, you know, us as athletes, and I know you went through it as far as like with Coach Grove and them, like it's what you did after practice, which made you a better man, you know, to come back to practice and perform. And with me being one of the, the leaders, you know, I knew I had to lead by example. So I couldn't be a slouch, man. And, and those those two coaches definitely taught me about, you know, just respecting the game and it respects you. So them two, without those two guys. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kev. Oh, no. Now, you, you have to have a Skip Prosser story. Everybody has a Skip Prosser story that you can tell, okay, <laughs> that, that you can tell. I mean, the biggest one I can remember is when I remember we beat NC State, like, and we had to turn around and play Florida State, and I never forget, we had to run some type of suicide or something. Now, mind you, we just won a big game, and the practice the next day was supposed to be light work, but I think it was one of those teaching moments where coaches were trying to get us to realize, like, it don't matter what happens, like, you got to come to practice and work. Well, anyway, the young Josh Howard had a problem with that, thinking, like, well, we did what we were supposed to do, and I decided to cuss coach out. <sighs> well, yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, I never forget coach turning the tables on me and giving me the business. And I never forget, you know, where he used to live weights at? Yeah. He caught he caught me right outside there. And I never forget he used to always do this to me. You 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 can't be doing this, Josh. Like, I, I should leave you here. And I, I still remember this to this day. And I was like, Coach, like, you know, I was just going through a lot. I thought we were supposed to have a chill practice. Um, and that was the first time he threatened me to leave me behind and take the guys to Florida State. And that was another eye-opener or teacher for me about understanding, like, the value of his coaching and the mentality that he wanted to have, no matter what you think or, like, the higher the mountain is, like, you can go higher as long as you push yourself, you know? So that story right there in itself was the biggest one for me because it was a learning experience for me. Um, but Coach always had good sayings, like um, – I forgot the loaf of the bread. He used to always say something about bread, and he used to mm -hmm. always tickle me because it'd be like, I, like, yo, you would have. It's the best thing since sliced bread. He would always reference that when you would do something, and I used to be like, what the hell does bread got to do with anything? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, everybody loves bread. You get what I'm saying? So yep. for me, yep. it meant a lot. You know, as far as coaches letting us know the love of the game and stuff like that. So. I, I definitely think that, think about that man to this day. I actually, you know, when he passed, he was supposed to come talk to my camp that day. And, um, you know, to this day, I still wish that people would have told me it happened because he never showed up. And then when camp ended, my mom told me. And I never forget just 
jumping in my car and speeding over the way, thinking he was going to be there and he was already gone. So, you know, that, that, that stuff right there still sticks out of my head. And I know, you know, he looks down on all of us, not just me, but, you know, Chris is the mm-hmm. CJs, the, the T's, everybody that came along. And, um, you know, he, he was a special man, man. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know no other man better than Skip Prosser as far as coaching, man. Like, and I went and got him tattooed on my arm. Like, he's been, he's been on me since that happened, man. You know, so I, I always hold him dear to my heart no matter what. That's great. Um, and, Josh, I appreciate you sharing that about uh, Coach Prosser because as I've gotten to talk to other players and been back on campus, I hear so many people impacted by him that weren't even a part of the basketball program. I mean, you talk not just not even just in athletics, but around the university and the city. You mentioned that name. That was like royalty mm-hmm. uh, to the city. And so I, I definitely, uh, you know, want to send a uh, shout out to his family and uh, as they continue yeah. to uh, grow and, and get through uh, him not being here. So, Josh, you talked about, you know, having to switch up your game a bit. You were playing center in high school and you had to learn how to handle the ball and get that mid-range game going. What was that like going through that process your freshman and sophomore year, having to add these new elements to your game? Well, it was definitely pressure um, because I was the only freshman again, and I was coming in there with uh, Robert O'Kelly, Josh Shoemaker, Jimmy, Jimmy Fitzpatrick. Uh, Rafael Vitoretta, Darius yep. Sangala, you know, I can go on, Nicky Arenzi, who, yep. you know, was the star in small forward. And I knew Nicky, Nicky was, when I came in, I was 6'6", 185. Nicky was 6'6", 250, 230, you know what I'm saying? Like cut, chisel. And I'm looking yep. like, this is who I gotta go against to get some starting time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but again, yep. like I say, Coach Odom and Coach Hayes, Coach Nesta, like them coaches definitely impacted me, you know, as far as like, you know, hitting the ground running, learning from Nikki, um, understanding, you know, Robert O'Kelly's leadership role, um, understanding Darius, and I say Darius, Shoemaker, and Rafa, uh, and Rafa, as far as like big men, and you have to respect your bigs in order to mm-hmm. get respect as a guard. So I, I just knew I had to soak everything up like a sponge if I wanted to impact, you know, the Wake Forest Demon Deacon basketball team. And um, that's one thing I did, man. I never shied away from information, you know, and that's one thing I try to teach my guys who I coach. I tell them you, you're stupid if you don't ask questions. You get what I'm saying? Because yeah. how are you going to learn if you don't ask? Like everybody doesn't know it all. So for me, you know, th- that first year experience, and especially coming from Hargrave, you know, mm-hmm. like I said, I to have that military experience put into me definitely taught me a lot of discipline with, uh, and I know you know this, study hall. Oh, we definitely had yeah. to, yes, we, we had yes. to play both sides <laughs> of the fence, man. So, yes. And and I seen a lot of guys say, you know, I'm gonna go to practice, but the hell with study hall. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I Miss Kyle, it don't work like that. It don't work like that. It does not work like that. Yeah, so, you know, that just that overall freshman experience and on top of, you know, I had a girlfriend in, at UNC Charlotte, so I thought I was, you know, growing up as a young man, but ended up, you know, losing that girlfriend at the end of the year, which caused me to focus more on basketball. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, it was definitely a learning experience, nothing that nobody could teach me outside of me going through it myself, you get what I'm saying? So, yeah. I'm kind of thankful that I had that freshman experience like that because, I mean, again, I wouldn't have turned out that that, that sophomore that I turned out because I was also worried about the sophomore slump that everybody yep. talked about and never had it. Yeah, there was definitely no slump. I mean, when you look back at your college career, you're talking about all ACC everything and yes, unanimous player of the year uh, since I think it was 41 years in between when you got it and David Thompson. So David you adjusted Thompson. pretty good, I would say, uh, at way <laughs> going through that process. Yes. So you, yes. so it's proven you're, you're a quick learner, very efficient. But, Josh, I want to ask you, so throughout your, your uh, college career, you played mm-hmm. against a lot of great players, a lot of big mm-hmm. games. I mean, you brought us home a uh, ACC regular season championship. What was that one team that you just got geared up to play? It didn't matter what our record was, what their record was. You knew, okay, this is the team I'm going to have to – I want to get up and play against them. Who was that team? Oh, uh, man. So, 
it, it could be several teams, but I can say my first two years, it was the Maryland Terrapins. Ah, Ron okay. Jackson, Steve yeah. Blake, Lonnie Baxter, Chris Wilcox. I think the Nicholson kid was on the team. But we knew Gary Williams had those guys, like, you know, top-notch, gears running, ready to play. And um, every time we played them, it was a dogfight. And I think they got us more than we got them. But, you know, the games that we beat them, it was like just like a weight off my shoulder. Like, whew, we got them one time. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Thank you, because we knew those were, those were basically NBA players. Pretty much all of them went to the NBA, mm-hmm. you know, and that, those guys who I named. So, um, and then, of course, you know, the Carolinas and Dukes are going to always be, a, you know, a rivalry just being in the NC State. But. The Maryland Terrapins definitely my first two years was the team that I definitely wanted to get up and beat. My junior and senior year, you know, I was just I didn't care because I knew we were the top dogs at the at that mm-hmm. time. So for me, it was just maintaining that that level of play where we can get recruits to come in behind us, you know, yeah. and keep keep raising weight for us. Is uh, I guess you can say basketball IQ as far as like people coming to see us play and stuff like that, coming to play with us. So. Yeah, y'all had the Joel rocking. Y'all really did yeah, have the hey, Joel going. It was I a whole about that level. Too. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I'm not, not saying nothing bad about the teams now, but I've been back to games and seen, like, the Joel, and I'm like, I don't remember when I played. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, that's you know, not we the Joel, yeah. yeah. But we're going to get it We're gonna get it back there. We're going to definitely get exactly. it back there. So, Josh, with, with everything you did in college, uh, before we get to your pro career, what was your favorite Deacon moment? Uh, one on the court and one off the court. Well, the one on the court is when we beat Duke. Okay. Um, I think, and that was the first time we beat them in Winston in a long time. And yep. to me, I, I actually fouled out that game. So I was the biggest cheerleader. I still remember having a headache, Kev, from the, that night from yelling and screaming and back and forth. <laughs> yeah. I knew we had a chance to win. Um, and off the court, I can honestly say um, we did uh, a toy drive where I dressed up as Santa Claus. Oh, and wow. I got, got the chance to walk through, you know, East Winston, where I'm mm-hmm. from. And pass out gifts. And to this day, I still think I think I have it framed either in my house here in Dallas or in my house in North Carolina. But I still have that picture with me with a sack walking down 25th Street, passing out uh, presents. And, the, the, you know, the caption was like, Josh Howard dressed as Santa Claus. You ready to spread Christmas joy. So for me, those two moments right there, as far as like, you know, again, being a humanitarian and what Wade Forrest thought before I got there was definitely a humble experience. And again, like I say, to be dude at home for the first time in years was definitely a great experience for me. So those two things right there for me were awesome. And I can kind of go back to Kev, another thing on the court that we did my freshman year was when we won the NIT. And a lot of people, they tried to discredit us for that, but it was like, well, we still went on like a six game winning streak and won the NIT. Now granted, (laughs) what they say, the the other other tournament, (laughs) something like that, but it don't it matter. matter. You were still playing. You were still exactly. playing while everybody else was at home. Say what you want to say, exactly. but you're saying it yeah. from the house. <laughs> exactly. So, Josh, I, I was I was looking back at your career. You had a chance to leave Wake early and go to the NBA. What made you decide to come back and, and, and finish the job, to finish it off and not go to the NBA then? Okay, so it's two-part uh, answer to that. Uh, the first one is Helen Howard, my grandma. Uh huh. At the time, she wasn't playing. She wanted me to graduate. Now we had other family members. Oh well, that's the answer right there. That's that's the answer. That's that's the <laughs> court dismissed. Just get that. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but I was I was kind of rebellious at times, and I knew I could have been in a lottery my junior year. We mm-hmm. had a practice, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the two names. You gonna you know both of them, Antoine Scott. Yep. And R D R D Montgomery was messing around one day in practice Uh-oh. as far as like we were scrimmaging. And I was running the baseline. I never forget this. Running the baseline, trying to do something. And RD ran into Antoine and they both fell on my leg and gave me the, the, the worst high ankle sprain. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but we went, we had to, we, we, uh, we had to play in the NCAA tournament, but we had to go to the West Coast. Mm-hmm. And I, cu- I couldn't play because of my ankle. And I think Craig Dawson had a killer game against, I think, Pacific or somebody where he had 42. But then he dislocated his shoulder. Yep. So 
that right there like made me realize and you know if I'd have rethought it, I might have still went because it was an injury. But, you know, mm-hmm. they was, you know, saying I was an older player and back then guys was leaving earlier than that. So I was like, man, I'm just going to come on back and, and see what happened my senior year. So, of course, grandma was number one, but that ankle injury really like tore up the last part of my year because I was on a roll as far as scoring and playing defense to the point where I knew I was going to go, you know, in the top top 10. But, you know, God does, does things for a reason. You give them yeah. plans, so. And I'm glad I came back because my senior year, and I know you're probably going to talk about it, like to this day, I still can't believe half of the stuff I've done my senior year. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was five yeah. freshmen up under me and my, my right-hand mm-hmm. man, Steve LaFour, who was my other center, he had tore his ACL. So I really, you know, I had a couple of juniors up under me and, and like I think like one sophomore, but the bulk of the weight was carried through my freshmen, those five freshmen that I had outside of myself. So that taught me a lot about leadership and you know, the influence I had on those young men as well, so. Now, Josh, you came and you were drafted in 2003. Now, Mm -hmm. that had to be, in my opinion, I would say maybe second or third best draft class ever in the NBA. If people want to know about it, Deacon Nation, check it out, do your research, and you'll find, I think we're, it's competing with, I would say, nineteen the 84 class, uh, and the 96. Yeah, 96, but you guys had LeBron, Dwayne Wade, Carmelo Anthony was coming off winning a national championship. So, it, uh, I mean, Chris Bosh was in that class. And so you're talking about a, you know, uh, almost like a once-in-a-generation type draft class that came. What was that like to be a part of that class? And you ended up making the NBA All-Rookie team that year. Exactly. Yeah. And it, again, a blessing, you know, to, to be in a draft class with those names you just called and to actually, you know, know some of those guys and, and get to know them throughout my NBA career. And it, it just spoke volumes about, you know, I could say the coaching that we all had at the time. And, you know, even us at that young age, understanding like we are role models, you know, so to even be a part of that class, like I said, it's just a blessing, man. Like I say, that goes back to like me just coming back for my senior year because I, I wouldn't have probably had the, the long career that I had if I wouldn't have, you get what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. I, I, like I said, I've, I've always listened to my intuition and I've always, you know, thought with my head and understood, you know, you know, you got to make the right decision for yourself, you know, and again, for me to make the decision to come back and if get drafted in this class, you know, I think it, it helped like, again out with my career. Now, you come in, you get drafted by the Dallas Mavericks first round. Uh, you have a, a, a rookie year, great rookie season. Now, you're starting with, Josh, when I look back at, at your career, you've been to the NBA Finals. You played with Hall of Famers. I mean, mm-hmm. you've been an all-star. What would you say is that highlight of your career when you look back on it? Um, The highlight of my career when I look back on it, outside of these saying, like, making it to the Finals, just in general, the respect that I gained you know, from the NBA community as far as knowing that I was a hard-nosed player that, that wasn't going to back down. And you was definitely going to get, you know, a good night's work with me because it, it wasn't going to be no easy pushover. And for me, you know, coming through those times, you, it was all about respect because I was still mm-hmm. having to play against guys like Allen Iverson. And, uh, I throw out names like Kurt Thomas, you know, yep. Junkyard Dog. I mean, the team that I came in on outside of Dirk Nowinski, Michael Finley, and Steve Nash also had Antoine Jameson, Antoine yeah. Walker, uh, Tony Delk, Travis mm-hmm. Best. And that was my fr- my my rookie year. Yeah. So, and those were guys that I was rushing home from church to watch, you know, <laughs> when they was in their prime. So, yeah. to, to, to gain their respect and then even to have a coach in Don Nelson, I mean... And I'm still like in my mind, like I really played for Don Nelson. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and he's a Hall of Famer, living up, living the life in Hawaii. So, again, for me to gain that respect, it, it speaks volumes to how people see you and how you approach the game. So, again, like, and I can say that, and I, uh, our other way for us, mate, Chris Paul, like 16 years in the league, man, and the things that he's done is just like, like hats off because I only played 11 years and I already knew yeah. my body was tired you get what I'm saying so <laughs> it, 
it just yeah. speaks a lot, you know what I'm saying, as far as that respect level. And then, like I say, to continue my career, I played 11 years and played through two ACL tears. And, and I played against like uh, the Steph Curry and the Kevin Durant, the guys, uh, James Harden, the Kyrie Irving. Like, I really had a chance to play against the old school and the new school. So for me, people can talk as much junk as they want, which I can care less, but they'll never be able to walk in my shoes and and, and understand the yeah. type of life I've lived and enjoyed because I wasn't, you know, just no Rudy Pooh player. As I say, I was actually yeah. a, a legit player. So again, man, like, just talking about it, like I said, and I don't talk about it much because I'm, I'm just thankful, you know. So to even yeah. put this out here like this is just a blessing for people to, you know, hear that. Yeah, I, it was real life for me. Like I enjoyed my NBA career. Nobody can ever take that away from me. Well, Josh, I'm gonna go out and say you you're more than just a legit player. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's, yeah. let's go. I get it. You know, you're humble. I get it. But yeah, there's no way somebody's gonna look back at your career and say, uh, eh, he was all right. No. Yeah. So <laughs> I want to ask you about playing in the NBA finals. We just went through watching uh, Chris Paul uh, play in the mm-hmm. NBA finals. What is it like to play at the biggest game in your sport, the NBA finals? What is that like? It's definitely a high level. It's, it's, it's a level that a lot of people will never reach or understand. Um, I used to, when people would ask me, I would say it was more so like an out-of-body experience. Mm-hmm. I still kind of remember when um, they called my name because I was a starter and I was standing by the, the life-size NBA trophy. And I'm like, this is this, like, this is real. Like, I am really out here <laughs> in the NBA finals <laughs> in my third year. Yeah. So, and that was another thing that I don't think people realize, like, as far as the responsibility that I had, like, I wasn't no dirt. Like, I knew what Dirk had to do. I knew what the guys around me had to do, but I knew what I also had to do. It, it let me know, like, you know, I'm, I, I reached a point in my life where I understood my job and I understood what I had to do before I had to do other things off the court. So, for me, uh, it, it was a surreal experience. And to even understand, like, we could have won it. Yeah. And how close we were to winning it. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely lets me know, like, again, like the experience that I had was something that, again, nobody could take from me. Win, lose, or draw. Like, I, I finally got over losing. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I've learned from losing, and it's definitely made me a better man and understanding who I am and how I can get back up from anything. So, it, yeah, it, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that you had to get over losing. And I remember they were interviewing uh, Chris Paul after the finals. And he said his attitude was back to work. Was that yep. a similar attitude you had when you went through that process after the finals, uh, back to work? What Was that your mindset going in afterwards? You see me shaking my head, yes, sir. Because <laughs> that next year, I think we had the best NBA record or like the fifth best NBA record ever mm-hmm. in the league. I might be inflating at it, but it was somewhere. because I don't think we only lost like 13, 14 games that next yeah. year. Now, now, granted, we ran into a hot ass team in Golden State, and they slapped the SHIT out of us <laughs> in, the, in the playoffs. That's all yeah. to them guys, but to know the mental capacity that we had to turn around, what three months later, mm-hmm. and start a season off after we lost, and and I, if I'm mistaken, Kev, I think we lost our first four games of that year, and people was already oh, wow. Ranked us off. Yeah, they were writing us off, Kev. So for us to end up, I think we was like sixty three and twelve something like that yeah. i mean again nobody can take that season away from me and that was my first all-star year that was, that was yeah. legit my first where i made the all-star team in vegas so again for me and like chris you say it's just like back to work you know at this point in my career this is what i do you know i graduated from school like you know my family took care of i just need to go out there and perform for the city of dallas and the dallas mavericks and myself and, and that's how i approach it what was it like playing with Dirk the whiskey? Okay, first of all, I think I've been pronouncing this guy's last name wrong for years. Okay, so all right, Josh, you a teammate, so you, you got you got to get this right. How do you pronounce yeah. Dirk's last name, and what was it like playing next to him, next with him, well, next to him? It's pro- it's, it's pronounced Nowinski. Nowinski. Okay. Yeah. So you really got to just let it go, Nowinski. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> and to play alongside a Hall of Famer like himself, along with, and I throw in Michael Finley and Steve Nash, because, you know, all three, that, that was the nucleus. Yeah. yeah. But Dirk, 
Dirk's work ethic. Like what I seen him do after practice is what let me know that man was special. Cause like I say, people get to see, you know, what we do on the court, mm -hmm. live games, but the practice and the time that we put in to become these great superstars that people, you know, idolize and things like that. Like, I don't think people understand the sacrifice, you know, and it's a bigger commitment compared to when we was in college. But also college prepares you for that, you know, next step is just if you want to take it or not. So yeah. I used to watch Dirk just, you know, do some crazy workouts with Holger, who was this trainer from Germany. Um, uh, I remember doing Pilates with Dirk and I quit. I was like, man, I ain't doing this. <laughs> like, I, I love you, but Josh ain't doing this. Like, I got some natural ability. <laughs> but, man, like, and he was cultured too. I tell this story, Dirk knew just about every Wu-Tang song you could possibly think of. Get on the bus singing wait a minute, and everything. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Time out, I'm sorry. I wanna know, what was your reaction? When you saw Dirt at seven feet from Germany coming in singing rapping Wu Tang, what was what was your first response? What the hell? If I can cut, where did he find this out? Who? What? What was you listening to? And I mean, and he knew it, but yeah. you know, you know his culture, man. Wu Tang was out there, man. That was like yep. one of the biggest rap groups then. So that that let me know. That he was my brother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> if I if yeah. I wanted to take somebody in the alley when it was dark, I was going to take Dirt. I was going to take Marquise Daniels. That's, <laughs> my, that's my right hand man too. You know, and there's a couple other ones, but you know, I just knew Dirt was a great individual on and off the court, man. And like I said, just to see his work ethic, understand that he came from a whole nother country to come over here and to pursue his dreams. Spoke a lot about you know his success and how he felt about life, and um, he was a humble guy. You know, yeah. you think I'm humble. Yeah. I took pages out of Dirk book to be humble just because, you know, he, he was a superstar then. You know, yeah. he's a mega star now. So, you know, I, I love the guy. When I see him, when I sneak up the game sometimes, you know, it's just like old times. Uh, hug my guy. And just, you know, just thankful to have that experience, you know, with those guys like that, man. So, you know, hats off to Dirk Nowinski and hats off to Germany, man. Because I heard I, I got a lot of fans over there because of him, you know, and me playing alongside him. So. I'm just thankful, man. Just very thankful. Josh, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, just you being a humanitarian and giving back. I've known you to give back your entire career, your entire life. And you talked about the picture uh, when you addressed the Santa Claus. That was just the beginning. That was mm -hmm. normal for you. So to Deacon Nation that may not know, uh, Josh gives back in so many ways, whether it's supporting other people and their efforts, his camp, helping kids, you know, where did that come from? Because you do so much in the, like in the community. What, where does that come from? Well, I used to always say when I started my foundation, I used to look back at Winston and try to figure out who was doing it for me when I was young. And I point no fingers at anybody, but it really, really wasn't no athlete that made it pro that could come back and really, give back. So for me, you know, Wake Forest gave me that platform and then the Dallas Mavericks gave me the income platform to be able to give back to my city. So that was one of the first things I thought about when I started to start my foundation and to do free camps around the city. And that was the biggest thing I wanted to do was free camps because I knew like everybody didn't have $125, $100 to get their kids into camp. So I part partnered with the uh, rec system uh, in, in Winston and you know, I just let them know that if you allow me to use the gym, that I, I wouldn't let you down. You know, I was going to make sure we was going to have, like, we did a kids' league at Reynolds Park. Um, we're doing an adult league now. You know, we do after-school programming. Um, even down here in Dallas where I did camps, then I also do a feeding program down here in the area, you know. So it, it, it's just something that I know, like, if nobody steps up to the plate and do it, it'll just be left by the side. And I, it's a lot of kids that's out there like you and me growing up where they just needed somebody just to point them in the right direction. Kind of like what I got at Wake, you know, yeah. and that goes a long way. And, and to this day, it feels good to see some of the kids that I've seen grow up, go to college, come through my camps. Um, like I had a young man that signed to Austin P. Um, and I remember him starting at my camp maybe like 10 years ago. His dad's a product of Winston as well, but 
those moments in themselves were so gratifying, man. And it's just because, you know, I, I just seen it as I didn't look for nobody to do it for me when I was young, but I just knew when I had a chance to give back and do it, I was going to do it, man. So that's why I do it. And then I don't look for nothing from it. I don't look for nobody to support me from, it, you know what I'm saying? I just do it out of mm-hmm. generosity of my heart and understanding like <laughs> Jesus did it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I walk in his footsteps. Why not? You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. That's but Josh, you've been, but you've been doing it so long. And recently uh, you had the, the court at Reynolds Park named after you. How did that yeah. feel? Man, that, that was another surreal moment, man. Uh, and I, I think I spoke when I said, <laughs> when they asked me to speak, I say, if y'all don't understand how many times I got chased across that golf course, <laughs> cutting through it. <laughs> because I wanted to get to the wreck and play ball and, you know, yeah. the golfers didn't want us to cut through their game and stuff, which we understood. Yep. We used to always look for the golf cart with the red flag. Cause you see that red flag, coming, <laughs> it's time to run. <laughs> so with that being said, man, the sacrifice that I, that my parents allowed me to, you know, cut through the woods, walk up there, trusting me to come back home. Um, just went to Salem parks and wrecks at the time, you know, you know, just opening their doors to kids like myself and the neighborhood kids to come in there and just have an outlet from where we was from, you know? And again, I took that and I just thought about how thankful I was to be able to come to Reynolds Park. And uh, Mr. Bonner uh, was one of the main guys. Mm-hmm. Well, he was a uh, rec system worker there at the time. And I got to see him at the court dedication. That was my first time seeing Mr. Bonner, probably since I was a teenager. So it, it, those memories came back and um, like I, I never, you know, I never forget Reynolds Park, or as they call it, Anderson Roscoe uh, Center. And, and and I mean, the Roscoe Anderson Center, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. And Mr. Anderson is definitely hats off to him and his family for what they've done in the community and for that place to be named after him. So like, I'm in-house, like I feel like I'm following behind them. So mm-hmm. I'm just thankful to, you know, be mentioned in the same sentence as them. You get what I'm saying? And like you say, just the years and years of me giving back. Like I say, I wasn't looking for that. You know, I, it's just, it's just amazing feeling, man. And I'm thankful to be, you know, stamped around the city like I am. Now, John, speaking of coming back and, you know, having a presence here in town, what do you think when you come back to Wake and you see the upgraded facilities for men's and women's basketball? It's amazing. I'm glad yeah. I could uh, play, play my Deacon Club piece. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's amazing, man. Could you imagine? And and at our time, our stuff was, you know, state of the art yeah. for what we had. But the things that these student athletes have now, like, there's no excuse for you to want to be successful. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. With everything that is, it is given to you as far as, like, the nutrition, the gym, um, the knowledge of that Wake Forest uh, teachers and trainers and coaches have, like, man, mm-hmm. if I were, again, if I could redo it again and see all that stuff at Wake Forest, man, I'd soak everything in like a sponge, man, and and learn from everybody from the football coach to the, the cross-country coach. Like, I used, to, I used to talk to those coaches, you know, just to understand, you know, what it was to be a coach, you know. So, again, to, to see all that now, man, it's amazing. And hats off to the people who still donate to the school because if it wasn't for that, you know, we wouldn't have those type of facilities too. So definitely thankful. Now, Josh, do you remember who your uh who those who given to your for your scholarship? Do you remember who that was? Did you get to meet them? Uh, yeah, the Hall family. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm still in contact. Landon, Landon, the, the son, the oldest son. Uh, Give him a Kenny shout out, Hall. Josh. Who who are they? Yeah. Deacon Nation. Who are you talking about? The Hall, the Alice Hall family. Yeah. Jackson Hall, all them, man. Yeah, the Hall family. I got an endowed scholarship. So my scholarship was they wanted a specific kid or they went and wanted to give their scholarship to me. Like they didn't want it to be like basically, you know, just giving. Like they wanted yeah. to have a, a sit down and understand like this is who we giving it to. And um, Mr. Hall, he passed away. And that's another man that meant a lot to me. But his family, I, I stay in touch with him. Like I said, I was about to talk about the grandson. Like you say, he just sent me an invite to uh, his baby shower. I know he might get oh, mad, wow. but I'm telling him. <laughs> you. So I'm, I'm going to actually come back home at the end of September for that, you know, just because, like, I used to watch them. This is how close yeah. I am to their family because 
you know, I was thankful for them to even give me that opportunity to come to Wake. Because again, I not to say anything bad, but I would have ended up going to App State because I took two visits there and I felt like that was the place that I wanted to be. And coincidentally, it was crazy that they were black and gold as well. You get yeah. what I'm saying? I just, I just want to hear you say that one more time, that Wake Forest beat out App State for one of the best players in basketball. I just want to hear, yeah. did, did I hear that correct? Okay, that's yes, good. Sir. Make after, sure you heard that. almost had me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> So, Josh, you 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 retired from the NBA and you start coaching. Was coaching always something you felt that you would get into or did it just sort of happen? It definitely sort of happened. I, <laughs> well, it happened. It, it was nothing that I wanted. I mm-hmm. knew how I was as a player. Sometimes I could get antsy and give some coaches some hell. I did not want that favor returned to me. So, you know, thinking that way, I never I never wanted to coach. But, and I can tell you the story on me coaching. So now I got the job at Piedmont. Um, it was actually the same day, maybe like six, seven years after Coach Prosser died. But it was on the same day and I was over there at Piedmont, wow. which is now Carolina University. And I was just doing individual workouts, just doing some to pass time because I didn't know what I wanted to do after I retired. And I never forget uh, Dr. Pettit, who was the president over there. He came in and he was just looking around and he seen how I was working out. And at the end of the workout, he said, Josh, um," and he talked to uh, my right hand man, Steve Nivens as well. He was like, Josh, um, my, my, my men's basketball coach just retired on me out the blue. And um, if you know anybody, you know, your friends, anybody that might want to, you know, coach, you know, give me a call. And he didn't know that was the same day that Coach Process passed. So. It was a tough day for me. You know, I, I knew mm-hmm. what was going on in my mind mentally. And i never forget, Kev, I was driving down the highway. I was going to maybe to Charlotte just to hang out. And something in my mind was just like, call him and tell him you'll do it. And sure enough, I called Dr. Pettit and I was like, Doc, I think I found somebody for you. And he was like, who, who you got? I was like, myself. And he was like, you don't pull my chain. He was like, you playing. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have, I think I had just went to the top 100, which MBPA, which is our Players Association, all for, for people who want to learn about coaching. And I went the year before just to get some stuff up under my belt to see if I like it. And I never forget, I told him, I said, well, I took these classes and I, I know the game. I, I basically passed the courses. You know, they give you a pass fail at the end of the week when you go up there. And I passed it and I was like, yeah, why not? And it was one of those things, again, just diving in something blind and didn't know what I was going to expect out of it. But I mean, 2016 really changed my life as my first year as a head men's basketball coach. And from that point on, I was able to understand that I was put on this earth to be a mentor, like no matter what the capacity was and to use my platform to help others, kind of like how the Hall family and Wake Forest did and, you know, Hargrave did for me and understanding that it takes a village to raise one. And if I can help help one, I can teach one. That's another saying that I say to my players. So for me, that, that day was a special day. And I never forget getting off the phone with him and thinking about Coach Frost. And of course, I shared a couple of tears because I know he was up there like he was probably the guy that said, it's you, you know, in my head. Yeah. So I took the job. And man, from this point on, I haven't turned back, you know, and it's just like I'm sitting up here thinking about, you know, the, the steps I took. And I got a picture over here with me and Coach Prosser right now that I can see in my in my view. And it's just like, wow, like I'm really doing something that he did for me. And I never thought that I'd be doing it, you know. So, again, I, I, I think about those things, those stories in my life. And I just try to use them to best the, my ability to teach and understand that I'm a very blessed individual. And I got to share these blessings. So now we're talking to head coach Howard at yeah, uh, University of North Texas at Dallas, head coach Howard. Yeah, so yes, Josh, I got to, so let me ask you this, head coach of the men's basketball program. I, if I sent my son to you, right, mm-hmm. sent my freshman son to you, what can I expect uh, from you as a coach? What are some of the things you are going to uh, instill in my son as a head coach? Uh, dedication and understanding his own personal morals and values. Like I can't throw my morals and values on him. I can definitely tell you what mines are and pray that you do take from him what you need. But the ultimate goal for me is to make you 
a young man by the time you graduate. I definitely want you to get your degree from the school and the opportunity is there. But the biggest thing for me, because that's what I got from Wake Forest, is I came in as a little boy, I left as a young man. And um, that's what I want every young man that comes up under me to understand. Even, and it's crazy you say that, because I talked to one of my former players from Piedmont, and he just said to me yesterday, Coach, everything that you was trying to teach me, I got it now. And I remember going through that same phase with Coach Price or seeing some of my former teammates go through it with their coaches. So for me, it's gratifying to hear these guys come back around and, you know, still want advice for me, still want to understand what I did to get to where I'm at and still want to just shoot the shit, excuse my language with me. You know, that's the best part right there. And it it lets me know, like, like I said, I don't want nothing from you but the best. You know, I, I, I've made my millions. I got my kids. You know, like, I don't I don't think I need left to do is to get married. You get what I'm saying? And so, yeah. for me, hey, I'm not looking for nothing from none of my young my, my players. It's just for them to graduate, understand who they are as a man, and try to pass on the knowledge that I taught them. Wow. Josh. Yeah. It's uh, thank you for taking the time out, man. I know you got a lot uh, on your plate, uh, but I ask every guest this: Who would you like to see sitting where you're sitting as a guest on Deke to Deke? Who should I talk to next? Hmm. Okay, let me let me. Oh well, I got one. Who? Robert O'Kelly. Robert O'Kelly. So you gonna help yeah, me make that happen? I can do my best. I definitely would do my best. And I, I would I love to talk is, to him. Cause he, yeah, he was one hell of a player. His freshman year, I don't think oh. people realize what he did. Oh. Like, listen here, li- yeah. Hey, Kev, you know, <laughs> yeah, he was breaking. Things. He was breaking records, just scoring records because he was the he was sort of that guy between you and that Tim Duncan sort of era. He he was that guy that came in and, and, and kind of filled that void in between. Uh, but yeah, that's okay. Robert O'Kelly, Deacon Nation. So you heard that. We got to try to get Robert O'Kelly on here. And I don't want to be biased because I'm a basketball player. Oh, it's too late. You did that with Robert <laughs> yeah, O'Kelly. So you might as well go ahead on and let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> okay, well, I, I'll text you some other ones I think about later on. <laughs> Okay. I got a couple that's floating through my head now. So I, I know it, it, it'll be some good stories because I know some guys like Terrence Williams. Ah, uh, okay. Rushers. Yeah. He, he, that's my guy. I definitely follow him, keep up in touch with him as far as on Instagram. And I know he got some good stories to tell. Uh, oh, yeah. He's He's got too many good ones. I'm going to have to keep him away from the football stories. That, I, I can't. We have to check the statute of limitations on some of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying, yes, sir. I don't know if we can let some of them out. I need to check with the NCAA first. But, uh, there you go. <laughs> and make sure it's sanctioned. <laughs> but Josh, what would you say to those student athletes at Wake that are coming into their freshman year? They're just getting there. What advice would you give them? Push through adversity because it's, it's definitely uh, – and I won't say wait, but just in general, you're going to get pushed out of your comfort zone. And it's how you react to it. And like I say, my freshman year coming from military school, I was a little rebellious. I didn't want to conform right away. I still was missing study hall at times. But once I realized, heck, I wouldn't even answer the phone for Miss Kyle Will sometimes. <laughs> so once I realized that's not the way the world works and I'm not going to be successful thinking that way is when I started you know, realizing it's time to grow up. It's time to figure out what's your morals and values in life and what do you want out of life. And it starts your freshman year. Don't don't sit around and think, I'm going to wait till my sophomore and junior year to try to figure out. It's only a handful of people, of students that can really do that. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So for me, the, the sooner you figure out what you want in life, the easier you can make it. And yeah. when I say that to my kids to this day, like, don't yeah. play around. I got a 13 year old that's in the eighth grade that's left handed and is way better of an athlete than I was at 13. Like, oh, I mean, wow. and I don't talk about my kids like that. And I don't even, I don't train my kids. Like, I let them mm-hmm. just grow up and do it. So for me, 
even teaching my own sons or my kids that it lets me know, like, again, like you just have to really understand what you want in life in order to get it, you know? And, and again, don't really depend on too many people to help you and the advice you get, please take it and hold on to it. Cause you never know the people that give you that advice. If they're, you know, not, you know, leave you and like, you never know. Yeah. That's the piece well, of advice I give to those freshmen out there. Well, Josh, one last question. How, you've had like all of us, we've had some up and down moments in life. How, how did you deal with adversity and bounce back from those things that have happened that maybe you didn't see coming or maybe like us, like all of us, we had those moments of just, you know, not mm-hmm. good decision-making. How do you overcome that adversity? Well, first off, understanding that you are human everybody makes mistakes like when i went through my issues yeah i was just a young man not knowing what to say and how to say it so i had to realize like it's okay to fall on your face it's how you come back from those mistakes and how you correct them you know and it's always going to be somebody that's got an opinion but you can always count on that but what have you done you get what i'm saying so you always got to find the good and the bad and make light of it is what I'm trying to get at and understand that you got to push forward no matter what you can't lay down if you get knocked down you got to get up you got to continue to push forward and make better decisions after you get back up so that's how I push through adversity um that's why I push through anxiety you gotta you gotta understand that that's just a part of life and you know it's just a, a nervous feeling and you gotta accept it and push through it but Josh, thank you uh, for taking the time out and talking to Deacon Nation and sharing your story and your journey and where you are now. And to Deacon Nation, we're going to be out here supporting you. Uh, and, you. you know, as you continue on your journey and uh, looking forward to having you come back and continue to be a presence uh, here in the Winston-Salem community. I mean, that's it's just awesome to look back on all of the things that you've been able to do in this short time in life. I mean, you got so much more left and I'm looking forward to it. And I, I can't wait to continue to support you and uh, to cheer you on. Uh, any any last words you got or, or you good? Well, I definitely appreciate you, Kev. You know, we've been, we've been rocking since college. Oh, oh my God. yeah, it's, it's been a long time. 